Ah, good morning again. Sometimes in our study of God's Word, we come across so-called tough texts. Anyone know the ones I'm talking about? They're tough because at face value, they seem to contradict other texts in the Bible. Of course, we know that the Bible is the Word of God, divinely inspired by Him and preserved by Him. Therefore, there can be no contradiction in this book. That's right. Infallible is the Word of God. As uncomfortable as it is, therefore, we must rightly divide the word of truth. We have to know how to answer the questions. We have to know the context. We have to understand the word of God. As it says in 1 Timothy 2.15, we have to rightly divide the word of truth so that we are always ready to give a defense, a reason for the hope That is in us, as it says in 1 Peter 3.15, which, by the way, is the foundational scripture for the series that I'm calling Prepared to Give an Answer. Now, we need to be equipped to answer the tough questions and the tough texts in the Bible. Now, I know I did one of these sermons in the series last week as we talked about judgment, but this week's topic has come up in conversation with people in this church two or three times over the past few weeks. So I really felt prompted to get it on the pulpit. So I hope you'll forgive me for doing back-to-back, prepared to give an answer, equipping sermons. Okay, well, I appreciate that. (laughs) Considering forgiving me, thank you. And warm your page-turning fingers up, because... If you've looked at the back of your bulletin, we've got some references today. <clears throat> so I mentioned tough, t- uh, tough texts and the controversies that they stir up. One of those big looming questions that a lot of people, a lot of Christians, new Christians, including members of our own church, have is the question of eternal security. Now, while there are verses in Scripture that clearly indicate once saved, always saved, There are others who seem to clearly indicate that Christians can still come under condemnation. Which view is correct? Well, we're going to have to look at the entirety of God's word in order to know the answer to that question. But first, let's just get it out in the open. This question is not just about eternal security. It's a deeply personal and emotional question for each and every one of us. It is the question, can I lose my salvation? And that's a scary thought and a very real concern to many Christians. Maybe even of the people sitting next to you in the pews. So even if you already know the answer, and I know some of you do, we all need to be equipped to give that answer to anyone who asks, anyone that has that deep concern, that deep fear in their hearts. And to be truly equipped, we have to be willing to deal with the texts that seem to contradict the answer that we know. So we're going to start out today in the epistle of Jude, second to the last book of the Bible. It's appropriate that it comes right before Revelation, which we're studying on Wednesday nights, by the way, because Jude is considered one of the strongest statements to the church today to be found in the Bible, just as Revelation speaks to a lot of things in our present day. It's a short letter by comparison. Jude is only one chapter, and just so that you understand the authorship, Jude was written by, in all likelihood, one of the brothers of Jesus himself. Now, much like the second letter of Peter, Jude, in his letter, addresses the problem of false teaching. More specifically, Jude talks about defectors from the church. This can make Jude a particularly troublesome text to teach from because it appears to speak of those in the church being condemned. 
Now, I'd love nothing more than to read the entire epistle with you. It's pretty short, but in the interest of time, so we're not here all day, I'm going to share the uh, last third of the letter with you today. And I hope that this week you'll go back and read the whole epistle. I will circle back, though, to some earlier verses because there are a couple of troublesome texts that we'll need to cover. But as I go through the sermon, we're going to go verse by verse through all of the scriptures that are relevant to the question at hand, can I lose my salvation? For now, let's start out with Jude, verses 17 through 25. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts, Side note here, in context, Jude is talking about people in the church. It continues, These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now, I shared the last third of Jude's letter because it contains the key to the proper interpretation of the rest of the letter, but we'll get to that in a moment. For now, I want to talk about these mockers that Jude is talking about. Earlier in the letter, Jude makes it clear that these divisive people that he's talking about, without the Spirit, that they are among us in our churches. Jude uh, verses 3 and 4, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our Lord God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They have crept in. They are among us. They are participating in the blessings of the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And in our reading, we read that they will be without the Holy Spirit and causing rifts and apostasies within the church. As an interesting side note, my New King James Study Bible heads the section that we read with the words apostates predicted. Now that's not scripture, that's someone's interpretation of those passages, but I think it's a good one. Jude is predicting apostasy within the church. That apostasy, by the way, was predicted by more people than just Jude. Let's read Acts 20, verses 29 through 31. Paul saw it coming too. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Not only will savage wolves infiltrate the church, but some will come from among ourselves, it says. And Paul is crying at that thought. This apostasy will lead some to commit what Mark and Matthew both quote Jesus as teaching as the unpardonable 
sin. We'll read it in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. So what is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that is so unforgivable? In the context of this chapter in Matthew, Jesus makes it clear that the Pharisees, in this case, have received a conviction of the Spirit that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Yet they reject him anyway. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is simply this. If the Holy Spirit testifies to you of the divinity of Jesus Christ and you choose to reject him anyway, then Jesus can't come into your heart. Think about it. We know the only way to be saved is to receive Jesus Christ into our hearts as our Lord and Savior, which we're only able to do because of God's grace through faith. If we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and yet we say, no, Jesus, sorry, you can't come into my heart. I reject you. Then we have closed that door. And that's what these apostates that we're talking about, what many of the apostles predicted, that's what they're doing. Worse yet, they are trying to get others to do it also. So if these evildoers will rise up from among us, yikes. In many other places in Scripture, it is predicted that the apostasy will come from within the church. It seems we have some concerns and some challenging things we need to face. The book of Jude alludes to the apparent contradiction that somehow believers could perhaps lose their salvation. The author of Hebrews is even more direct with his language. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Well, bummer. Because it sure sounds to me like we as Christians can fall away and lose our salvation, doesn't it? A little bit. Matthew goes on to explain how it happens with another one of those tough texts, Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Great. Now we feel like we can be deceived led astray, fall away, and lose our hope of salvation. Really encouraging sermon, Pastor Greg. Good job. Not feeling too secure right now, are we? And neither are the countless people who will bring these texts to you and say, what does this mean? Because I'm scared. Because I think this means I can lose my salvation. These are the texts people will seek an answer to. So let's get equipped. First, we need to talk about who these apostates are. Second, I need to remind you of some important promises that God has made to you in his word about your salvation. And lastly, I'm going to share with you a practical test to know if you can have salvation, if you do have salvation, and whether or not you can lose. So to begin our equipping, I want to circle back to our reading in Jude. I promised at the beginning that I would reveal to you the key 
to interpreting this tough text. The key is contained in Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, who's able to keep you from stumbling? Is it you? No? Are you able to resist sin and walk in God's ways unaided? Nope. Because all have sinned and will absolutely fall short of the glory of God. But God, the Holy Spirit that indwells us, indwells a true believer, absolutely can keep us from stumbling on his merits, not our own. And can God fail? God cannot fail. <laughs> Jude goes on to give credit to the same Spirit for be being able to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Now, just kind of as a little quick upliftment here, I want you to think real quick about any Old Testament examples of anyone who came into the presence of God's glory and how they reacted to it. Was it with exceeding joy? Usually not. Trembling, fear, Falling flat on faces comes to mind. Yeah, trembling, losing the ability to speak. The presence of God entering that presence as sinners is convicting. The only way we could possibly stand before God's glory and have exceeding joy in our hearts is if we were pure and completely free of sin which we are in Jesus Christ. Praise Jesus. <laughs> so when Jude talks about these mockers who follow ungodly ways and cause divisions within our churches, it stands to reason by his own key in verse 24 that they don't have the Spirit in them. In fact, it says it in our reading today. They haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But Pastor Greg, you say, what about Hebrews? What about Matthew? What about the fact that the predicted apostasy will come from within the church? Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Not everyone who goes to church is a Christian. Not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. Not everyone who proclaims the name of Jesus Christ has received Jesus Christ into their hearts. 1 John 2.19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us us. John, in this letter, is speaking of those he calls the Antichrists. Those who say they are in the light, but are actually still in darkness. The truth is, not everyone who goes to church is saved. Not everyone who says they are saved is saved. The apostates are those who claim to be Christians but have not accepted Jesus Christ into their hearts. Can they lose their salvation? Of course, because they don't have salvation. So yeah, they can apostatize. Jesus, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, in Matthew 24, uses the perfect analogy you see, tares are a type of weed that in their early stages of growth look an awful lot like wheat stalks. So you don't know they're growing up among your wheat. They look just like the wheat. But they're useless at harvest time. And Jesus talks about how the tares will be among the wheat. Not next to the wheat, not outside the doors of the wheat. 
but right here in the pews with the wheat. And in the last day, they will be gathered out separately and burned. Just because someone is among us and goes to church doesn't mean that they're a Christian. Okay, but Pastor Greg, you reply, what about Matthew 24, 24 that you just read to us? It says that false Christs will deceive the elect. Wait, does it? Actually, that verse we read a few minutes ago says that these false prophets will, quote, show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. Now, the original King James translation of that particular passage reads, if it were possible to deceive the elect. And in this particular case, I think that translation is a little closer to the original meaning and intent of this passage. If it were possible to deceive the truly elect of God, which of course, it's not. They will try. They will do signs and wonders to try, if it were possible, to deceive those who are truly saved. They will succeed with many in this world, but they will not succeed with true believers, with God's elect. So those of us who have already truly received salvation, the next question is, can we lose it? Let's see what God promises. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. So first, salvation is a gift from God, which we accept through faith that that faith is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It's all gift. And at that moment, we are no longer ourselves we have a new nature, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And brothers and sisters, I am here to testify to you that that new nature is Christ's nature. Although we still struggle with the lifelong process of sanctification, of trying to get better and better every single day, that overcoming of the flesh, we are fully and completely Christ's at the moment of salvation. And Christ's nature cannot be corrupted. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's done. We are at peace with God. We are reconciled to God. We cannot be at odds with our salvation. In fact, our salvation at that moment is guaranteed by God, as it says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Give everybody a moment to turn to this one. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, that's us, to the praise of his glory. So often I hear people quote John 3.16, that whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life, 
not conditional salvation, not temporary life, but eternal life. And you know what? That is a good scripture to quote in response to the question of eternal security. But frankly, I think Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 is way more powerful. I think if we're going to be equipped, let's add this verse to our arsenal. Because listen to what it's saying. Ephesians says that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. It's in the bag. We cannot lose our salvation. We've got to be equipped, brothers and sisters. Let's add Ephesians to our arsenal. So that brings us kind of to our final point that we can know that we are saved. How can we know that we've truly received that salvation that God promised and God cannot break his promise nor can he fail? We can know that we have received salvation. We can absolutely know that for certain. There's no guesswork necessary here unless I suppose we want to agonize in which case we're free to do so. No thanks. <laughs> Second Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So what it's saying is that we can test. There is a test. There is a way to know whether you have Jesus in your heart or whether you're not qualified as a believer. The first and most obvious test is the one given repeatedly in Scripture. We've talked about it several times from this pulpit. And that's by their fruits you shall know them. If God is working good things in your life, even amidst your continuing struggle with sin, struggle with the weaknesses of the flesh, but if God is working good in your lives, if you're producing the fruits of righteousness to any degree in your life, then we know it's not on our own merit. We must have the Spirit's help. The Spirit must be in us producing that. But it's not just outward good because many people can do seemingly good things with the wrong motivation. We can also know by the love that we feel towards others. And not just our family and our close friends. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, ultimately, the test that Paul the Apostle used when talking to new believers is really the one that we should be using as our shibboleth. Our shibboleth. what? <laughs> Anybody know that word? Just curious. Awesome. Quick, nerdy history lesson. Hey, you guys hired me. <laughs> shibboleth. In the book of Judges, chapter 12, Jephthah who was one of the judges of Israel, defeated a rebellion. It was after a war, and then the Ephraimite tribe rebelled. And he defeated that rebellion, and the Ephraimites were trying to get out of Dodge. So since they looked a lot like Jephthah's men, they figured they'd just pretend to be Jephthah's men while they snuck across the river. Jephthah was smart. He knew that because of their accent, the Ephraimites couldn't say the word shibboleth, which just meant stock of wheat, by the way, in those days. <laughs> they couldn't say the SH sound, so it came out sounding like sibboleth. Sibboleth. And Jephthah and his men, when calling on them as they crossed the river, hey, say shibboleth. If they couldn't, they knew they were the enemy, and they discovered many of the enemy that day. So the word shibboleth then, because of that story in Judges, took on a whole new meaning. If you look up shibboleth in the dictionary, it does not mean stock of wheat anymore. It now means a test to discover someone's true identity or nature. Shibboleth. It's a good biblical term. <laughs> good one to know. 
And as I mentioned a moment ago, because I have to circle back to our point, <laughs> get off my nerdy tangents. Paul used a shibboleth when talking to new believers to determine whether they were truly saved. Acts 19.2 is the test he used. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Yikes. Somebody's, somebody didn't do their job. <laughs> That's okay. Paul was there. And he went to work baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ and anointing them with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And just like we read in Ephesians, that Holy Spirit within us is our guarantee. When we receive that anointing, when we've truly believed in the name of Jesus and accepted him as our Savior, when we truly accept Jesus into our hearts, we receive that seal, that guarantee. Acts 2.38 then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you that from that moment forward, that moment of acceptance, when the Spirit indwells us, you are saved. Period. And we read in Ephesians, it's guaranteed. With the gift of the Holy Spirit, we know that we will begin to shake our sin nature. Not that it'll go away instantly, but we will begin to desire to be good. Not because we're capable of desiring to be good. We're fallen. We're sinful. But with the Spirit in us, we can have the desire. We can actually make change because it's God making the change in us. And it's not that we won't sin anymore because I guarantee you we will but it's that we won't continue in a state of unrepentant sin. We will know by our conviction that we know we need Jesus. We will know by the fruits of that Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. No, brothers and sisters, we cannot lose our salvation. Let me be perfectly clear. If it's genuine salvation, we can't lose it. We know nothing can snatch us out of the hand of our Savior. John 10, verses 28 and 29. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Not those deceivers, not those apostates we talked about that were predicted. There is no one that can remove us from the hand of God. We know that when God chooses us and calls us and we heed that call through grace by faith, that is the gift of God, and we are seen as perfectly justified and purified in the eyes of God because of the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Romans 8.30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. These, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What wonderful news we as believers have to give to those people who struggle with the question, can I lose my salvation? If they've truly accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they cannot. What a wonderful thing you get to tell them, to reassure them. And if they haven't, they can accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. What wonderful news you get to tell them. When we're properly equipped with the answers, when we're not glib or dismissive, oh no, I just know it's true. 
No, you've got to give them reason. You've got to give them God's word. And when we're properly equipped, we can lead them there by God's grace. Not that it's any achievement of our own. But we can be God's instruments in leading them to an acceptance of Jesus and a confidence in their own eternal security. Trusting in Scripture when it promises Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. And I know I've shared this one before. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hosanna. Praise God. I leave that thought with you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's get our guitar.